from Ed Sheeran that is two step from new to old Anglo-Saxon times middle ages fifth century you remember don't you you were younger then what's your picture the meeting in the Middle Ages. You'd be forgiven for thinking uh, that they were kitted out in long cloaks, tunics, gathered round a fire, devouring a meat feast, chicken legs and the like. But new research has scrapped this image as it shows that in fact, they mainly ate a vegetarian, plant-based diet of grains and veggies. So what else about history isn't quite as we thought? Uh, Gillian Hovell is an author, historian and archaeologist and joins us now. Good afternoon to you. I know you've been listening to BBC Radio Jersey uh, this morning, yeah, haven't you? You've been enjoying it, Gillian. Have you been enjoying it? I've actually it? been listening to your thing about the uh, dogs on test drives. I took mine. <laughs> well, uh, you... Have you really? This is amazing. So our survey found, our survey yeah, found 22%. And you are what? Tell me more, you tell me. Sit on the back ledge, or used to when it was legal, but I also had to take my meaty, long red and white archaeology pole. You see them in photographs of scale, and I had to be able to fit it directly into the boot. The poor salesman, I could see him thinking, I'm going to go home and go, you'll never guess, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so you took a dog and a pole with you. I need to know more about both of these things. If the dog fitted on the back ledge, it's got to yes. be what is a sausage dog, a Westie? No, it's Ken Terrier. And he loves sitting on the back ledge, so on the parcel shelf. And some cars have got a very steep back window, so he'd have been washed. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> had to know that he could sit on the back ledge. I need to know more about the pole that you need and as an historian as well. Let me know more about this. Yes, well, you, when you look at archaeology pictures, you might see a red and white striped pole on the ground or sticking up. And they are one metre long. If you put two together, they're two metres long, obviously. And each of the red or the white is 20 centimetres. And this means that you, when you take your photograph, you can see how big. So, you know, I, I could hold something in my hand, but that would give you a scale. But if it's on the ground, you have no idea. And you don't want the archaeologist's thumb sticking in it or something else. This is the standard way you do it. So I drive around with red and white poles in my boot but you don't want them diagonally across the boots it uses up the space well there you go i have been educated already by chatting to you Gillian. this is amazing well yeah i mean they're they're like oh i'm glad she's gone kind of a thing yes, of sorry to say it but my dog was very clean i must say good and also then you feel the pressure don't you it's like me when i go and try every item of clothing on in a shop i then feel even if i don't want it i have to, I have to buy some stuff did yes, you end exactly. up buying because you felt you had to Yes, a little bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they've really made their day quite different. <laughs> Are you talking to me from your house right now and in and in your and in your kind of drive you've got about fifteen cars because you couldn't say no. That's what we're talking <laughs> if about. Only I could. Oh, if only you could afford <laughs> that. Me too, me too. Anyway, Gillian, now we've been yes. talking about um Anglo Saxon times. We thought these were times where people ate a lot of meat and we're finding out now that we might be wrong about that, aren't we? We are indeed, yes. It's amazing what science does. Most people think archaeology is digging holes in the ground, which it is, because you have to find them. But then the real work starts. Uh, I, mean, I love being in the trenches, uh, and I'd much rather do that bit. But you pop it along for analysis, and you get the uh, academics to look for it, the scientists to look for it, and they study the bones. And it's amazing what we can find from those bones now. We can tell what kind of food they ate, they can look at the diseases that are marked on the bones so they know they didn't have gout and things like that. So they weren't eating huge amounts of animal protein, which if they'd been doing the, the typical Anglo-Saxon film, you know, slobbering over your joints of beef and all of that, they would have eventually had uh, certainly some medical issues or, showing, or the levels would be showing up in the bones. But they're showing they mostly ate vegetables. So mm. imagine a kind of broth. So you have your barley and your beans and your all sorts of things, and it's flavoured with meat. If you're lucky. Right. Yes, yes. I understand. Mm. Why did we think then originally that there was a lot of meat in the diet? <laughs> well, when you dig, the things that you find are the things which haven't decayed, to be blunt. So you find stone and ceramic, your know, pots and the like. But what also survives out of the organic are the big beefy bones, the ox bones. So when you look, you don't necessarily find many fish bones and you certainly don't find plant remains. Mm. But over decades, a site might have a jolly good midden, as we call it, a rubbish tip of beef bones. 
Right. So that kind of makes you think, oh, they ate a lot of beef, but it's not that way. And and when you found this out, did then that change other things about what you knew about that time and other historians indeed who who focus on the Middle Ages, perhaps? Well, I mean, the really big change for that era was we'd call it the Dark Ages because there's not much written. There's some lovely illustrated manuscripts and the like, but literacy wasn't a great thing, so we haven't got much we can read about for it. And then we sort of called it the Dark Ages and thought that it was a bit primitive. And I don't know if you, your listeners remember the Staffordshire hoard being found. It was uh, 2009 it was found, I think. And this wonderful gold and glitz, it was warrior bling. It was soldier stuff, but it was fantastic jewelry, stones in it and we realized their skills for art was phenomenal actually so we now say the so-called dark ages there we go so called really. yes <laughs> so there we are thinking they're barbarians you know say chewing on the bones more or less and uh you know being a bit on the rough and ready side and it might not be like that at all they could have been slurping their soup <laughs> there we go. It's fascinating this. I'm just wondering what science is going to tell us as it gets better and better about oh. history in, in years to come. I mean, what else in history are there question marks around? Are there any things you, you expect yeah. to see maybe proved further, mm -hmm. cemented in history or, like this, turned upside down? Yeah, well, the, the science, again, is the bit that actually gives us the clues. And when we dig... Uh, when I was being taught to dig, I was told you only dig half of a feature because you should leave, you, you never ever dig the whole site because you leave it for the next generation because they will have science that the stuff that we go, oh, it's just nothing and it's soil. Could you believe you can even get DNA from soil now? They found it in cave wow. deposits. So they can find out whether it was Homo sapiens or Neanderthals or what animals were there, even without the bones. I mean, it's pretty early days. Uh, for it and there will be things which are unimaginable to us that they can say oh if only they hadn't thrown that out it's why we have shelves and shelves of collections because people come back to them and in covid several uh, archaeologists could, you know, couldn't go digging in covid etc and they went back to the shelves and started looking at old bones and finding out new pieces of information and going gosh you know we can now find out where they came from because this, on the teeth on your enamel, your enamel teeth, contains the the strontium, the, the, which has come from the water that you drank as a child, as your teeth were developing, and it has a trace element which can, we can pinpoint to where the water table was and the rocks around it, so we can say where you were as an infant from the enamel on your teeth. What? It is breathtaking. <laughs> It's, That's amazing. Uh, who could have guessed you could do that? That must be yeah. so exciting as an historian, is it? Uh, you, you know that one new discovery can change history. Yeah. Which is why we say when people are metal detecting, you know, don't just sell them. Your one find might change your local history. They might go, oh, there were Romans there after all. You know, we thought no one lived here. And Gosh. it's so exciting to find who lived where, who came from where, mm. what state their health was. Because that's what's fun. Well, it's not about the dead, it's about the living. How it, did they well, live? brings me to my next question, uh, the living and um, finding out where they're from and what they've done. Um, what about you, Gillian? I'm going to get nosy now. You've worked on BBC TV quite a lot. You've had a fascinating career. Can you tell me a bit more about how you started out and what you've done? Yeah, it's one of those things. Life sort of goes its own way, doesn't it, really? Uh, you, you can imagine all sorts of things and then you look back decades later and go gosh how did I get there uh, and I did Latin and ancient history at university because I'd been read tales of Greece and Rome by a fantastic sort of granny figure at primary school and uh, it was all exciting this world then I did a bit of Latin uh, as we did at school then and so I went on to university to add more to this came out and just thought well, I, I don't know what I want to do who don't, did at that point uh, got into the BBC, travelled around the BBC in the programme areas. I wasn't in front of the camera, although I'm very happy in front of it now. But then I was behind the camera doing bits of research and admin and things like that. And then I stopped to family. I moved up to Yorkshire, wanted to get back to the history, saw a little local archaeology class 
for 10 weeks. If you think archaeology is not for you, look again. There are community archaeology groups and you can just go and join in with even if no experience. And of course, I got there and then went, oh, Bronze Age, that'll be this. Oh, Iron Age. That. And they're going, well, how do you know that? <laughs> Might have studied a bit. Um, yes. So I ended up pretty much, well, I ended up at the front. And then I discovered that I had a gift for lecturing and telling people about it and getting them excited about it. And uh, it has snowballed. Mm. <laughs> it's, people say, oh, come back, come back, come, do this, do a study day for us, do a talk. And so I lecture nationally and internationally and my bones aren't as old as anglo-saxon but they're not as young as they were <laughs> so although i go in a trench once a year uh, i you? no longer run a site and i no longer dig every week which i used to do and so i've dug from neolithic orkney the ness of Brodka, yes. which is another site that changed history five thousand years ago these stunning big engineered buildings with artwork uh, just changing the way we viewed life when farmers settled down up there. And I've dug in the Pompeian site in Italy, um, the, the Roman sites, Vindolanda and the like. And the joy of being the first, the thrill of being the first to see something that's 5,000 years old made by someone. Oh, wow. Absolutely. The first person to pick it up. I loved it when I ran the group because I could come for, straight from the field, go and give a lecture and say, I've got this bit of pot that was found, you know, last week. Who wants to be like the sixth person ever to pick it up since it was found? Wow. And I loved that, but I'm not in that position anymore, but it's because uh, I'm not running it. But that connection with people, that's what's the thrill. It's mm. seeing how people live, knowing you've handled something somebody made, and even being able to feel where they put their thumbprint. Wow. Oh, incredible. Incredible. I find it absolutely fascinating. I wondered if you if you do enjoy that, whether you've had a visit to Jersey before and La Cotte, La Cotte de St. Brillard. Have you? Absolutely. I, I've been a couple of times to Jersey and I, well, my poor children, when they were little, were dragged around all of the sites. <laughs> they just used to say, tell us now where the archaeology is, the beginning of the walk, the middle of the walk, or the end. I'm going, well, it's actually all three. We're sort of going past a few. <laughs> you have the most fantastic... Okay. And you had something that changed history, too. It was, when was it? Uh, only a couple of years ago, uh, you had the piece of the engraved little tablets, stones, that 15,000 years old are the earliest art in the British Isles. Mm. So you pushed back the boundary. Yeah, well, being I, artistic. I didn't want to show off, but but you're you're <laughs> correct about about we do we do what we can, Gillian. You know, <laughs> it's brilliant. You've got <laughs> lovely sites, wonderful sites. I can't wait to come down again. <laughs> you must you must come visit us. Yeah. I know. If anybody anybody wants me to come and tell them about the Neolithic? I'm there. We'll be the there. Shop. I actually Direct do. Flight from Leeds, I could be down. <laughs> I do find it all fascinating. So you don't need to convince me. But but having read about you on the internet and stuff i do know that you get asked the question um what use is latin and ancient history as someone who who's taught it teaches it uh, and shares uh, your love of history um you answer because it's fun can you please for anyone who's listening and who's not yet convinced tell us why it's fun yeah, I spent three years doing a degree of people go, why are you doing Latin and ancient history? And I go, well, what are you doing? And they're going English literature. And I'm going, I'm doing the origins of your literature. <laughs> so, so no, 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 no. Yeah. It's fun because you're viewing people living in another world. The Latin is fun because you can, you, you see English words in a completely different way. So we are transmitting this program. And trans, that comes straight from Latin, which trans means across, so transport carries things across. Transmission literally sends the signals across. And it was a Roman word long before radio existed, and it meant sending whatever you were sending across, and we have adapted it to be a very technical word, the transmission of a programme. But, you know, with COVID, transmission of COVID too and all of that. So I can't imagine living without being able to play with words mm. for the Latin. And my doctor hates it. He said I had a rodent ulcer. I went, no, no, it means it's gnawing into me. Because that's what a rodent means. It's a creature that gnaws in Latin. And uh, he said, oh, you're such a pain. <laughs> <laughs> I can't hide anything from you. <laughs> but it's lovely to always have that context about so many things that we hear and see day to day, isn't it? 
It is. It is. History is all around us. And one of my things I do is I show people that there is history through the ages. Wherever you live, wherever you're sitting now, people have walked across it in the Anglo-Saxon times. They walked across it as early humans. They walked across it just a couple of hundred years ago. Romans will have walked across it, probably, if you're in the Roman Empire. Wherever you are, d differing layers beneath you, there are not literally the footprints, but people have walked in that mm. area and left some hint that they were there. Oh, some of wow. it would have survived, some of it not. But we are only part of the story. We are an ongoing part of the story. And they're no different to us. They were humans like us, just living with different resources, different belief systems, perhaps. But still, they loved and they loved beauty and you know, they had their angsts and all that. Yeah. So it's a privilege every time to touch something or walk into their homes if you get you know if there's remains of foundations of homes to visit the past quite literally it's fascinating it makes me yeah. think sitting here in my swizzly chair whether that's uh, <laughs> making a physical mark on things and whether the crumbs that i drop from my regular biscuit eating <laughs> in studio two here are, are going to form a Depends little if part you have mice and the mice bones of history. <laughs> that, there we go oh there's always another level there's always another level isn't it jillian it's been fascinating listen yeah. all the best with that rodent ulcer is it cleared up yet oh it's all clear oh all thank gone. goodness for all that sorted. thank yeah. goodness you can they focus back it, on it <laughs> you can focus back on on the history and the tutoring and, and all that you do. Keep up the Thank amazing you, work. Thank you. Gillian Hovell there, author, Ooh. historian, archaeologist and public speaker um, on the discovery that Anglo-Saxons didn't devour meat feast. As it turns out, they were largely vegetarian. We also unpick some of the other misconceptions in history and um, delved into exactly why history and Latin and more are actually really fun.